And frankly, the Democratic Party in Louisiana is pretty much on life support system. Nobody can say it's dead, but it is definitely on life support. And in the next few months, a lot of people expect to see a shakeup in the leadership of the Democratic Party in Louisiana. These very same people are the quickest to try racism at the slightest provocation or for no reason at all. There's no systemic racism. There is no law. There is nothing that says that I can't do something as a black person that you can do. We're honoring all of the great white men who are being smeared and defamed and torn down. If I were to compare Saturday's election results to a movie title, perhaps I would choose The Empire Strikes Back or Avengers Infinity War. Like villains Darth Vader and Thanos, there was a complete show of crushing force against strategically overmatched and anemic opposition. Republicans completed the nearly clean sweep they started in the October primaries. In addition to retaining the statewide offices of Lieutenant Governor, Secretary of State, Attorney General, and Treasurer, Republicans strengthened their grip on the Louisiana legislature, where they now have veto-proof majorities in both chambers. They had already won the Commissioner of Insurance seat and let us not forget that they took the governorship in October when Jeff Landry defeated 14 other opponents, garnering 52% of the vote. Saturday's runoff vote turnout was less than 24% to go along with a less than 37% turnout in October. John Cuvion, a Louisiana-based pollster, estimates that only 17% of voters who went to the polls on Saturday were black. 26% of blacks early voted. Overall, 24% of Louisiana's black voters showed up for this runoff, as compared to 72% of white voters. It was a recipe for the disaster that we witnessed, but it was a recipe of our own making. Governor-elect Landry, who managed to skim off 12% of the black vote in his admittedly historic primary win, how did that happen? is already hinting at backtracking on policies that Governor John Bell Edwards put into place. Edwards provided parental leave pay for Louisiana employees. Under the policy, state employees, some 70,000, who welcome a new child to their families will receive six weeks of paid leave. But Landry questions whether the state can afford it. Translation, he'll likely undo it. Landry is poised to undo environmental advances made by the Edwards administration, saying that the governor's carbon neutral policy is extremely destructive to our state's economy. His first announced administrative appointment, the head of the Department of Environmental Quality, looks more like a political maneuver than a real interest in improving our environment. Aurelia Skip with Giacometto was President Donald Trump's former U.S. Fisheries and Wildlife Director. Politically, she fills several slots. She's a well-educated black woman with proven conservative credentials, but she's never lived a day in Louisiana and is not likely to engage in any meaningful conversations with communities that are on the front line of enduring the health dangers of the petrochemical industry, predominantly black, brown, and poor people. To the victor goes the spoils. We're getting a glimpse of just how damaging a Landry administration may be. According to New Orleans journalist Clancy Dubose, part of Governor Landry's transition team is tasked with blazing a path for the governor to issue executive orders to usurp control of New Orleans, the state's largest city, from Mayor Latoya Cantrell and the city council. How do you have a committee focused on New Orleans that includes no one from the New Orleans mayor's office or from city government, but is headed by individuals that unsuccessfully sought a recall on the mayor's election? And if Landry is successful in taking over New Orleans, who's to say that he will not seek to do the same thing in our city of Baton Rouge, major cities with black executives and democratic strongholds? What will Landry do in New Orleans, Baton Rouge, Shreveport and Alexandria with state police in the name of curbing crime or public safety. He's appointed Tony Clayton as co-chair of that committee. But the black Republican district attorney for the 18th Judicial District has consistently and vocally opposed Governor Edwards' bipartisan efforts at prison reform. Moreover, Clayton's prosecutions, both as district attorney 
and as a special prosecutor have infamously targeted black elected officials. Do we think that that trend is suddenly going to reverse itself? What will Landry do with elementary and secondary education now that he's the one who appoints three Bessie members and backs up the Bessie chairman? He's placed Eddie Responi as the head of his transition team for K-12 education. Responi is a failed gubernatorial candidate and a man with no experience in public education. But he's a champion of charter schools and voucher programs that allow public dollars to pay for private and parochial schools. What will Landry do regarding redistricting? Despite what the Supreme Court has said, the Louisiana legislature seems poised to take an oppositional tack to federal judge Shelley Dick's order for a fair remapping of Louisiana's congressional districts, giving to our state a second minority majority district. And at the 11th hour, we're not sure how a recent decision by the U.S. Court of Appeals will affect redistricting going forward. Monday, the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals upheld a lower court's ruling that private citizens and groups like the NAACP cannot bring lawsuits under a provision that forbids discrimination in state and local election laws. The court found that the key section of the act can only be enforced by the U.S. Attorney General. This upheld a decision by U.S. District Judge Lee Radofsky, a Donald Trump appointee, who in 2022 dismissed a lawsuit challenging Arkansas's new district map because he said that the Justice Department had to join the plaintiffs. According to the Advocate newspaper, the Eighth Circuit's decision will probably be appealed to the Supreme Court and the justices may be inclined to consider it, along with a conflicting ruling on the same issue by the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit. Writes the advocate, if the Eighth Circuit ruling is upheld, it could weaken the tools used by voters of color and voting rights activists to ensure voting access by marginalized groups, by blocking individuals in private groups from using Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act, which passed in 1965, that allows citizens to bring legal challenges to redistricting decisions and other actions that weaken their voting power. The appellate court vote was two to one. Writing for the majority, Judge David Strauss, also a Trump appointee, wrote that while courts have for much of the last half century assumed that Article II is enforceable, a deeper look has revealed that this assumption rests on flimsy footing. In his dissent, Chief Judge Levansky Smith of the Eighth Circuit wrote that while admittedly the court has never directly addressed the existence of a private right of action under Article II, the court has repeatedly considered such cases held that private rights of action exist under other sections of the VRA and concluded in other VRA cases that a private right of action exists under Article II. Until the Supreme Court rules or Congress amends the statute, I would follow existing precedent that permits citizens to seek a judicial remedy. Rights so fundamental to self-government and citizenship should not depend solely on the discretion or availability of the government's agents for protection. This leaves Louisiana's black and brown voters in a quandary regarding the future. We have no friends in the executive or legislative branches and inconsistent help from the judicial branch. But let's be clear, we brought this on ourselves. I do not agree with community activists, social justice hawks, and others who wish to blame our dismal record of black voting on tangential things. The reason for our not voting was not because of homecoming on our two major university campuses. Early voting gave everyone plenty of time to exercise their civic responsibility. The reason for our not voting was not because black politicians did not do enough to advocate for voting. The reason for our not voting is simple. We were trifling. We were idle when we should have been involved. We were frivolous when we should have been ferocious. And it was not just in this election cycle. This has been an ongoing malady within the soul of a people who, if they had any sense of history and accountability to those who came before us, would have been to the polls in record numbers. It's not hard to register to vote. It's not hard to cast a vote. But if you're too lazy, too disinterested, too negative, 
are too trifling to honor the sacrifice that was made for you to vote, then you get what your slothfulness has entitled you to. In this case, it is a minimum of four years of being locked out of the political process on a state level. Crying about what has happened is not beneficial. It is what it is, but all is not lost. After the empire struck back, there was the return of the Jedi. After Thanos' Infinity Wars, the Avengers had an endgame. In other words, we can regroup so that we can recoup what we have frittered away. It starts with next year's congressional and presidential elections. This is something we should pray about. Lord God, we pause this evening to seek your forgiveness for our slothfulness when it comes to performing our civic duty and engaging fully in the voting process. We vividly see the costs associated with not voting, and we ready ourselves for a state government that is insensitive to the needs of our people. We ask your guidance for the Jeff Landry administration and upon the incoming Louisiana legislature. We acknowledge Mr. Landry as our governor-elect, and we ask that your wisdom might prevail upon him, that he might be open to your leading so that Louisiana might experience the reality of our motto, union, justice, confidence. Going forward, dear God, we ask that you might grant to us a greater sense of personal responsibility and accountability when it comes to civic engagement, that we might become more informed and that we might rely on that information in our voting. Help us to organize ourselves into units committed to a higher quality of life for all our citizens. Help us to be positive, affirming, and aspirational. Cover us, dear God, with your love. Support us with your power. Motivate us by your spirit. Illumine us with your knowledge. Guide us into places where our desire is to do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.